Ryan Stanton here with ASM Frontline, joined today by Dr. Arun Nagdev. Uh, he's here because one of the big things that I talked about uh, when I do lectures on um, opioid sparing techniques and the opioid epidemic and making sure that we are adequately, appropriately treating our patients for pain um, is the uh, so was the use of the ultrasound guided nerve blocks. And that's a huge uh, transition. It is one of the big ask items for many of the departments, community facilities especially, is there. Uh, it's not just putting a protocol into the system, to the EMR. It's actually getting some training, uh, observation, uh, and, and uh, protocols in place to make this happen. So I want to bring him in here because he's uh, performed a lecture, did a lecture here at ASAP 19 in Denver, snowy Denver. I hear today it's 70 something in home, 74 in Lexington, here at 70 in Rochester, and it is like 18 and snowing uh, here in Denver, and it snowed almost every day we've been here. So exciting days, exciting times. So it's a great day to be inside in the dry and warm uh, to talk about uh, ultrasound guided nerve blocks. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Nagadev, thanks for joining us here on the front line. Uh, thank you for uh, having me, Ryan. Um, I'm really happy to be here, and uh, I'm really excited to talk about this subject that is uh, very near and dear to my heart. We probably spent about 15 years getting this going in our department, and uh, been very excited about teaching this to everybody. So let's talk about it first. Why, why regional nerve blocks for the management of musculoskeletal pain? How, what does it offer us? you know, over other techniques, and also uh, what is the safety profile of these techniques as well? Yeah, so I'll start off by talking about why, and I think that, I think we have to reframe the question when it comes to pain management, and the, the classic concept that we've always been taught is this monomodal therapy of picking a medication and one size fits all, and I think that we have to think about pain management in the same way that we think of anything else. This is a therapy that's multimodal, that means using different avenues from can use opioids, to ketamine, to regional anesthesia, to gabapentin, but to tailor that medication and active analgesia mm -hmm. for the patient. And so if you have a guy with a large hand laceration uh, on the palmar aspect, sticking a needle in your palm and numbing it up is, is not cool. That's not going to be comfortable. Here's a nice, nice method to both give analgesia and allow irrigation and repair, and it's something that has completely revolutionized our practice. So with that, what are the, what are some of the risks, uh, risks uh, of these procedures and things that need to be concerned before we dive in, kind of a global yeah. standpoint, we'll talk specifically when, uh, about the procedures we're gonna d discuss, but kind of globally, what are the things we need to consider? So I think that, I mean, I, obviously training is important. I don't think this is a high, and I, I say this for my anesthesia colleagues who are gonna get very angry at me, I don't think this is a high level skill um, we train this to our interns, we train this to our various practitioners in our ED. We've done this training overseas to ortho technicians who've done 5,000 blocks at, uh, in the Congo working on patients. This is a standard technique. If you're a good proceduralist, which I think most emergency physicians are fantastic proceduralists, this is something in your toolbox, in your armamentarium that can really change the way you practice. and improve patient care. Okay, so you talked about the, the hand, and uh, what would be, if you're putting, folks listening out there, they need to put in the, the first procedure they want to do, what's the best one to add, uh, kind of the first step, the one to get this process and program started in your department? Yeah, so I think it depends on your department. Again, tailoring this to what you where you work is really key. If you're working at a shop that is in the Northeast, you have a lot of hip fractures, and your ortho department is reasonable, i.e. they read the literature and they look at their own guidelines, I think the femoral nerve block is an ideal place to start. It is a generally a simple block. It is a low-risk block, and it gives great analgesia, not anesthesia. And I, I want to be very clear, analgesia along with what else you're doing, such as IV pain medications, for your patient who has a hip fracture. This is great for intertrochanteric hip fractures. It works fantastically well. If I'm working at a shop where I have you know, tertiary care ortho saying don't touch my patients or you have seven anesthesiologists that are like, I don't want you to do anything. Hand lacerations are a great place to start. I think rib fractures are also a great place to start because here you're going to inject these guys with, with a serratus block, which we'll talk about later, and probably send them home. Mm -hmm. And in that's in my particular facility, we have a significant elderly population. So uh, we have a ton of hip blocks. And so that's where we started. Uh, with the femoral nerve block, 
and um, we've loved it. Um, and so in our, our facility, we've got on, uh, everybody on board from uh, orthopedics, which is it's still community, so they're all private folks. They're good with it. And then our anesthesia folks who put together a lot of the training and had a couple cadaver labs that they were already performing for their folks, so they had us come up um, once their stuff was complete and allowed us to do the, the labs as well and uh, placed it in and instituted it in our facility. It was about a one to two month like ramp up to get all the training done, all the pr uh, procedures done. I mean, in terms of the uh, policies, procedures, um, and break down training for the nurses. Actually, that took longer than the training of the physicians yeah. because they were very nervous about uh, pushing these medications yeah, and, and such. Of course. of course, they heard the horror stories of, yeah, got to be careful. This is in the artery. We're going to end up with arrhythmias. Right. Of course, it's super low risk. And actually, once you do one or two, you have to be. Um, you have to really see that um, there's a pretty decent gap. You've got to yeah. get a good running start to get past through the nerve into the into the femoral vessels. And so we put that one in during the day, weekdays. Our um, anesthesia is happy to come down and go ahead and place the catheters in for more Great. sustained uh, stain drip type methods. Uh, but after hours at night, weekend. Uh, we do them in the emergency department as soon as we know. Uh, typically, if we know there's going to be a fracture, we go ahead and set it up, even while they're doing the x-ray. Uh, if we don't know, uh, as soon as we get the x-ray, see the fracture, we'll go ahead and get everything set up. I did one right before coming out here to Denver, Colorado, on a young uh, young person who'd actually come in with a hip fracture, kind of a re weird story. But I uh, did the block, and the pain goes from a 10 down to a 3 just with the block. Fantastic. Resting more comfortably, finally gets a little bit of reprieve from uh, what he was feeling with his symptoms. So it, it's, I think that one's a fantastic two, uh, one to work in. So let's talk about some of these procedures. Yeah. Um, of course, idea being we're going to talk about them here. Once we talk about them, you do a little bit of research, look into them, and then start to set up that training uh, and policies, procedures that you're going to use in your department. It takes a little while to, up, uh, to ramp uh, these things up, but at the same time, um, it's, it's something that's going to help our patients and, and care and throughput in the emergency department. Yeah, and I love what you mentioned. What you mentioned was, one, it's a multimodal strategy, i.e. the block and the pain meds, but it's also a multi-non-siloed approach to pain management. So, i.e., my anesthesiologist is on board, my ortho is on board, so we all work together mm -hmm. to offer the patient pain from the minute they hit the door to okay. the minute they leave, rather than what we've classically done is attempted to diagnose the patient, sit there for five hours, let somebody else deal with them. And I think that's the beauty of what we're trying to do and really the way that we're going to change medicine as a whole. And yeah, that's what we like. We work super great relationship with our anesthesia. They are almost immediate. Great. If we call during the day, they'll be down within five to ten perfect. minutes. Perfect, perfect. At night, our nurses uh, get all that stuff together, and we are ready to go within uh, 10, 15 minutes from the time the patient comes in the door if we know there's a fracture, and we're ready to roll. And now the whole procedure, once we get going, get into the room, that procedure is maybe five minutes at yeah. most. Yeah. Um, and the patients actually do quite well with it. So let's start off with, let's talk about some of our types of blocks. Let's start off with number one. What do we yeah. want to start with yeah. first? Yeah, I think we can start the femoral nerve block because I think it's a block that is uh, really doable at most centers. And again, we talked about this earlier. I think discussing it with your colleagues is key. And I mean that in a non-departmental way in other departments. And so I think the femoral nerve block is nice. It offers analgesia for hip fractures. And really that classic anatomy that most ER physicians know, nerve artery and vein is really what we're looking at. And when you look at images, and you can pull these up anywhere on, a, on an ultrasound machine or on a uh, website, you'll see that classic representation of that triangle. That triangle is both a complex of fat and usually nerve. And there's this fascial plane called the fascia iliaca that kind of hugs down and keeps that nerve right next to the iliopsoas muscle. And I know that's a lot of terminology really quickly, mm -hmm. but I think a picture is worth a, worth a thousand words here. And if you see it and you recognize that same triangle every time next to that artery, that's the key. And it is really neat. It's, it's a pretty clear image and it almost gives you, as you roll over uh, in that viewpoint, it's a really nice angle pulling in um, with this little honeycomb pattern. And um, of course, it's a, it's a ton easier to see in young uh, folks with uh, thinner fat planes and more pronounced muscles that defines it really well, but we've had no issue whatsoever in seeing these structures uh, on our elderly, even the most elderly patients, 90 plus year old patients coming in. Uh, it's pretty easy to see. Uh, so let's walk through this uh, procedure, yeah. what we need to do. So what we commonly do is uh, I, I tend to find that triangle in the artery and move my probe a little lateral. I always put the probe parallel to the inguinal ligament, mm -hmm. slide a little lateral, probably get half of my femoral artery in the screen so I have a nice view of the muscle 
that triangle and the nice fascial plane that runs over it. And then my goal is to get a needle, and you can use any type of needle. You can use a cutting needle, a non-cutting needle. You can get block needles at your department. You can gently come in after giving a little bit of local anesthesia, down, 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 and pop underneath that fascial plane. And that's really the key. Once you get underneath that fascial plane, you inject gently, and this is the key, right? It's one to two cc's, maybe three cc's, stop, aspirate, make sure you're not hitting anything, you're not in a vessel, you're not in an artery, inject one to two to three cc's, make sure on the screen you see that nice big black area of fluid, keep on doing that. There's no rush. When you look at anesthesiologists doing this, they have a surgeon, he or she's waiting for complete anesthesia for them to go to the OR, and if the block fails, they get general. For us, this is not about complete anesthesia. It's about analgesia along with everything else you're doing. So we, what we're using, and see if you're similar, similar for you, so we're using about five cc's of the 1% lidocaine. You can Perfect. do one or 2% for the local, just mm -hmm. where your skin penetration site. Once we get that in place, we, we, we have a, uh, a, a needle actually designed for ultrasound uh, guided procedures. Great. And then uh, place that, get it, get it, feel it pop up under there. Um, we'll have the nurse aspirate a little bit, flush just a little bit of saline in there to kind of see if we're in the right place where we are. And it's that picture of, and what I always call it is kind of floating the nerve. Yeah. Instead of seeing just a little bubble of fluid, you are actually uh, see it kind of penetrate that triangle and it kind of floats the nerve just a little bit. You know you're in the right place. And so with our procedure, we're doing about uh, most healthy adults, uh, adults, especially uh, that 100 kilogram male type size, uh, really anything other than uh, really smallest, uh, smallest of patients. We're using about 30 cc's of the 0.25% bupivacaine. Yep. And um, we'll use that just little small aliquots, push a little bit, a few cc's, make sure that we're still floating well, aspirate again, keep floating until we get that full 30 cc's in. And really it takes... Even that takes a minute, two minutes yep. max. That's exactly right. And that, that technique is exactly the way it should be done. And, and the beauty of it is, is it's a nice delivery method for anesthesia close to the nerve. Mm -hmm. And again, I think when I started doing this, I wanted to get right around the nerve. It's not about getting it right on the nerve, but it's getting it close and it tracks to the nerve. It's a lipophilic compound. That means it penetrates fat, which is your nerve shells are covered in fat. Remember the swan cells from med school back mm -hmm. in the day? So it's a great way to get great analgesia in and it's that really region. more bathing the nerves. It's yep. like just what I talked about with floating it. You end up floating it, and you'll see it kind of work its way around it, and then it then it bathes the nerves, and it's just sitting there in its own little bath of bupivacaine. Um, and what I've seen is it takes about five to ten minutes. Patients have pretty significant improvement um, at that point with their with their analgesia. With this, so we've placed this the block now. Uh, we've got it all floated. Everything's great. Uh, key being, if you're going to bill for the procedure, making sure you have the patient identifiers, uh, that you take the appropriate, as is stated for billing, take the appropriate pictures for the procedure, which can kind of be a little bit difficult because you're holding a needle and you're holding a probe. So have somebody there that can hit that freeze button or hit that uh, save image button or cine clip button, you know, whatever it may be to make sure that you have the appropriate images in there so you can document it uh, for billing purposes because, of course, these are uh, fantastic additions, uh, augmentations, not only for the patient but also for um, our, our revenue as well. And, um, so, and then after that, the big thing to worry about and watching for is, of course, potential. So the, the, the two big side effects that people commonly talk about when it comes to femoral nerve blocks is one is if you enter a vessel and you're aggressively putting in, ideally, bupivacaine, that can cause, again, if I inject 30 cc's of bupivacaine mm -hmm. into somebody's artery, that bupivacaine will end up in two very lipophilic places. One's the heart, and one's the brain, and those are, the, the medication is a sodium channel blocker. So they classically will have dysrhythmias or seizures. And again, that is very, very rare. That is a large push of bupivacaine, and mm -hmm. we commonly, for beginners, I recommend lidocaine. As they get better, to get more comfortable with their needle visualization, they can move to bupivacaine. Um, so I think it's really rare. We have not had any cases of it because we stay far away from the vasculature, and always stop the procedure if you do not see your needle tip, or you do not see that nice black anechoic fluid that comes out when you push. And you can always, um, if you're not quite sure, you can always switch back to the saline and do some pushes there and, and make sure. But really, you're not even close. You're a couple of centimeters yeah. you know, from the actual vessels. And with the technique of aspirating and flushing, the chances are incredibly small. Uh, but part of our procedure uh, is to have some of the uh, lipid infusion available. Yeah. 
the first couple of times, the, the nurses would spike it and everything. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> we just need to have it available, like airway yeah. supplies for yeah. your sedations. Just have it available. Um, and and we've had, we haven't had any issues at this point. You know, our department, each of us has done uh, probably 10 of these um, over the last few months. We haven't had any issues whatsoever in terms of any concerns, but you know, just making sure you, you, you do that safely, especially when you're new into this procedure, uh, because what you don't want to do is, is kind of shortcut the procedure, not do your proper aspirations, visualizations, confirmations, and then be flush and be pivocane into the vessels, and now we're, we've, we're yeah. creating not a block, we're doing a cardiac procedure. <laughs> yes, yes. And also, like before you do the procedure, you should always just make sure that the neurovascular exam is documented, there's yes. no gross deficits. Because you don't want somebody to come up and say, well, did this person who has a mild palsy, is it from your block or is it from the break that has happened beforehand? So if there is a true nerve deficit, which is very, very, which I've never seen in a hip fracture, but if you have one, I would recommend probably not doing that block right. and not confusing or confounding the two, A, the injury and B, the block itself. And we won't do, and we won't do this procedure on anybody on anticoagulation, so especially the DOEX, things like that. And then um, anybody with significant bleeding disorder, we're not going to do that. Um, you know, I'm, and there's some data that I've seen that it's not really a significant bleeding risk, but at the same time, that's one where we tend to preserve that for uh, in the OR uh, in those controlled settings. Even though, you know, most things show that in the emergency physicians are getting the same outcomes and low risk of complications that anybody else in the hospital Correct. is getting. Correct. That's totally correct. All right, what's, what's uh, an, the next good one you want us to hear about today? So, so the next one's something that has been kind of on the radar for about three or four years. It is uh, a pretty fresh new block, and it's a block that's very different than what we've classically talked about in blocks. And we use these specifically for patients with uh, multiple rib fractures. Our trauma service is now literally when patients come in with rib fractures and you know they're going to get pain medication and not take deep breaths, uh, they get this block they ask for it, and it's a standard procedure. We do this for zoster patients as well. This is a great block for pain control in the thorax and the chest. It's called the serratus anterior plane block, and this is a little bit more confusing, but the point being is that you're giving a planar block into the chest, and the point is that we all know that our thoracic intercostal nerve runs from our spine and comes around. There's a place where they break out and they innervate the serratus muscle and the chest wall. So they, on each level, we have these thoracic intercostal nerves coming from, you know, all the way from the top of your chest to the bottom of your chest. What's nice is if you can deposit anesthetic above the serratus muscle, or actually even below, but we just generally do it above, you deposit that fluid in that space, it will track up and down in a cephalad and caudal direction and give almost a complete hemithorax analgesia, which sounds crazy, but it's amazing because you will have your patients with three anterior rib fractures, three lateral rib fractures. You walk up with a 25 gauge needle. I'll talk about the procedure. Do a small injection and they will tell you in about 30 minutes, because it's a planar block, it's not going to work as fast as that femoral nerve block, that their breathing is better. They feel better. They want to go home, even though the orthopods are your, your our trauma services, like you, you can't go home. You're, you have four rib fractures, ma'am. It is completely revolutionized the way we practice. We use it for our stable chest tubes. We'll do this block, we'll tell the trauma service or our ER residents to put the chest tube in and they just, and that's the only thing it doesn't really work for is the, the pleura on the chest, mm -hmm. but otherwise it works really well for chest tubes, zoster, anterior and lateral rib fractures. Now, so let's talk about the medications here uh, with this, because this is a, a very fascinating, how, how long of a anest uh, anesthetic effect analgesic effect are we talking about here with this type of block? Yeah, so it depends on what you deliver. So I've had patients that uh, have rib fractures who are going home. I, 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 I think you could use bupivacaine with epinephrine. Uh -huh. That can last up to eight hours, 10 hours. And really the goal, I think, in this pain control therapy is when people have injuries, their pain is high, but they're also, they call it the wind-up phenomenon, where right. your brain brings it even higher. The initial reduction in pain and comfort Starting the patient on oral medications or IV medications, 
really just never gets them back to that point of initial injury. And we've all had either a broken bone or initial pain. That pain is the worst, and then after that, it generally reduces. And it's just breaking that cycle. That's exactly and that's, right. So you catch up and kind of get a little head start on it, and then um, hopefully with your medications, you're not going to... Gonna, and that's the key discussion to have with patients with any of this stuff is we, we had this huge fallacy over the last 20 years that we were going to get people pain-free. That's not the goal. Our goal is to get people into a tolerable position to where they are not uh, significantly disrupted uh, and, and with severe pain or you can't sleep, those sorts of things. So you have to make sure that discussion, that I'm, my goal is not to get you to zero pain. That's not realistic and it's probably not safe. Our goal is to get you comfortable enough that it's tolerable during the healing process uh, or comfortable uh, dealing, during the healing process. You know, most of us can deal with that, you know, two, three uh, out of ten pain you know, and, and deal with it. And then if necessary, especially at sleep time, of some, amp, ramp it up a little bit in order to help folks get a little bit of sleep. All right, let's walk through it. So I think, again, the this is a little confusing anatomy on a podcast. It's really hard to do. It's probably the first time I've tried it, but we're going to try it. So really what you want, to, the first time if you want, want to see somebody do it, getting a model laying in a either left lateral or right lateral decubitus, you can actually see where the latissimus dorsi comes, and then the chest wall is anterior. So latissimus dorsi is posterior, chest wall is anterior. In the middle of those serratus muscles, you ever seen a boxer, they have those nice big serratus muscles. The probe should sit, again, pointing towards the nipple and the anterior axillary or mid-axillary line. When you do that, what you will see is that classic rib shadow, that was something we all see really well, and that pleural line below it. You're comfortable doing that if you're looking for pneumothoraces. Mm -hmm. The muscle that sits right on top of the rib is the serratus anterior muscle. It's called the serratus because it's serrated, i.e. fluid can track up and around it. It's not a full muscle, it's like fingerlets, if that makes any sense. The goal is to get fluid in the space right above, in this fascial plane above the serratus muscle. And what you do is you come in, again, this is a planar block, so you're not really looking for a nerve, you're looking for a plane. And again, the same idea, Ryan just talked about this with the nurses pushing, we come in with this needle, pop, pop into that plane, and gently inject normal saline. And the goal is when you inject that normal saline, you will see fluid tracking mm -hmm. in that plane on top of the serratus muscle. And that fascial plane you've opened up, and then you inject the anesthetic. And you can use, again, lidocaine with epi if you want to be a little more safer. If you want it, what we do, we do pivocaine with epi. It lasts a little longer. And then as the patient breathes, that fluid, which, which is proven by MRI studies, tracks in a cephalad and caudal direction, giving you a nice block of the chest. How, um, how much volume are we talking about in terms of either one of those two? Yeah, so I generally do a 10 cc volume of normal saline to open the space up because okay. it gives me a really nice visual. I'm showing Ryan this nice video and you can see that space popping open with just normal saline. Right. And then replace the, 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 the anesthetic and put in the anesthetic you want. Replace the normal saline, inject the anesthetic gently, again, two, two to three cc's, aspirate, two to three cc's, give the 20 cc's of bupivacaine, which we like, and then I usually flush my line with another 10 cc's of normal saline. So it's a 40 cc volume, but it disperses all through the right. chest. And again, this is not gonna work. If you stand there and say, ma'am, are you feeling better in five minutes? She'll be like, no, it still hurts. You kinda have to go, get your coffee, see another patient, come back, and you're like, wow, now it's really working. They'll be breathing better. The key is to any of these procedures is understanding when you do the injection, you've gotta see that dissection. That dissection uh, between the, the fascial layer with the fat on top down to the uh, uh, serratus. And you'll see it. It's, and that's the big thing to learn is what it looks like when you're actually kind of dissecting those fluids. So the fluid doesn't just ball in one central location. You actually see it kind of push those away. And that's what you look for. And that's why it's nice to start off with normal saline because it's a good way to, one, make sure that you're in the right place and help to make that dissection um, happen. And then you have a, an open area, an open little uh, pool to put your to put the actual anesthetic in. Yeah, yeah, and, and this is and this works really well. We published this in the ASAP Now magazine a few months back. I want to say about six months back. And I got a lot of uh, really positive responses, and I think people have been doing. I, I taught a course in uh, in Dublin. We had some physicians totally integrated in the practice, and this is used by numerous centers up and down California as a standard procedure for all the rib fractures. And then. Uh, 
and it, it looks pretty easy, and it's something you can add. Is again, is to get on top of the management of the discomfort, get the patient home with the other modalities, and then also having a discussion with the patient that says this is going to last, should last, improve your uh, uh, discomfort for several hours, up to about eight to ten hours or so uh, max. That that's fantastic if that happens. Uh, but then also um, uh, letting them know that it's it's just something to help on this stage to maybe break that initial cycle of yeah, pain. Yeah, and the, and, and the key is once you do the block, actually start them on a pain protocol and not wait for the pain to come back. So that's the key. Patients, oh, I'm in no pain. I'm done with I don't need any medications. So when they s- get the block, you're already still on a pain protocol to reduce that pain from coming back. Okay. Do we have any more on this one right now? No, I think we're good. I think we're good, right? Hopefully- These are a good start. These are two great ones that any of us can do. Yeah. Um, I look forward. I want to bring you back because I want us to do um, some of the hand. Yeah. Because there's a laceration course. related. Um, we've got, we, I learned um, with our anesthesia, triple nerve, uh, to get basically the wrist and the hand. Nice. Um, so it's some fantastic things we need to look for. And actually looking at some of the more proximal blocks with the lower extremity yeah. uh, for the potential of uh, even more of a uh, femoral head or even getting into the pubic rami fractures yeah. because the femoral nerve is not going to get that medial aspect as well. But if you go a little bit proximal, you can actually get those a little bit better. Yeah. And the key is to get start to get used to it. Once you learn one block, then after that, you know the techniques for the blocks. The technique is the exact same. The only difference is... What you are, what are, what's the anatomy that we're visualizing with our probe and understanding what you need to see, what you need to do in order to get that uh, in the proper place. Uh, I really appreciate it. That's Thank you. fantastic. Um, look up uh, these. There's videos all over the dang place. ASAP Now has all this yeah. stuff on uh, PDF, so you can pull them yes. up on ASAP Now. Pull them up on ASAP Now. If, if you're looking for videos, I'll often put just pull videos on, on YouTube and Google uh, to look at these uh, types of things, to see the block, see techniques, see a little bit different anatomy. Uh, and then work your way through. It's it's a little bit slow ramping up process. There is a learning curve, but once you get that in place, it is fantastic. It's comfortable. You enjoy it. It's another procedure because we all love procedures, and it's great for the patients as well. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it's it it falls into our opioid sparing uh, missions now, but also with improved management of pain, better than what we were doing before Correct. with lower risk to the patients. How can folks get in touch with you if they have any questions or uh, need to want any more guidance on how to get this done? Yeah, so we have a website, highlandultrasound.com, that does a lot of uh, block work. I also publish a column in ASAP now, so there's a lot of uh, uh, hopefully monthly or every three-month columns coming out, some about blocks, a lot about blocks, actually. And uh, they can always e- email me at my first and last name at gmail.com. It's uh, arunnagdave at gmail.com. And if you want the spelling, uh, Arun is A-R-U-N, Nagdev is N-A-G-D-E-V. Um, look that up. Fantastic. Great. I'm go- hoping you're going. I'm going to have you send me that link Great. as well because I'm going to be on there because I'm going to start learning. I'm going to learn this block Great. as soon as I get back to Lexington because I've got some shifts this weekend. Um, until next time, I'm Ryan Stanton. You can contact me, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, youreverydaymedicine at gmail.com, or at Everyday Med on Twitter. And until next time, you've been listening to ASAP Frontline. Frontline.